Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, as people are joining. And I know we have that moment on Zoom where uh, your audio connects or whatever, but it's um, already nice to see, gosh, I think someone from Switzerland. Um, and uh, hello, Jane. And um, people uh, who I know have uh, known Felicity um, over the years, but also uh, some, uh, you know, who are meeting her in this way for the first time, uh, as it were. So um, it's really lovely to welcome you. Uh, as a reminder, I'm Christopher. I'm the newish director of resource. Um, and uh, we've been having these winter Wednesdays, as we've been calling them, uh, talking to some fascinating people. You can catch up with the previous three weeks uh, on our YouTube site. Um, and I'm really Delighted that this lunchtime we're joined by uh, our trustee, uh, Canon Felicity Lawson. Um, Felicity has been associated with Resource and before that, Anglican Renewal Ministries uh, over, one has to say, many years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's no other way of putting it. Um, but Felicity has been um, a huge support to me ever since I first engaged with resource a few years ago, leading what was then called the resource future process and looking into uh, both our history uh, and our possible future, though at that point I had no even inkling that I might ever end up in the director's chair. Um, but Felicity really has seen um, the story of renewal, not just in the Anglican Church, but in other denominations uh, in this country over many years. And I think um, you know, it, there is an undimmed enthusiasm, which I find, um, you know, infectious, really. And so that was why I was so keen to invite her to be part of this discussion. Um, so sparing any further blushes, Felicity, <laughs> it's lovely that you are here. And um, we're going to follow a similar format to the previous week. So Felicity and I will chat um, the two of us for the next half an hour or so. Uh, but please do add into the chat if there are particular questions you'd like to raise, particular aspects of the renewal of the church, past, present and future, which is uh, our, our title for today. Uh, if there are particular things you'd like to raise and then we'll bring uh, you in and your comments in uh, from half past or thereabouts and then have some time for prayer towards the end uh, of the hour. And we will finish by two o'clock uh, to honour your lunch times. Um, and as we've said previously, the eating of sandwiches or the slipping of soup is perfectly welcome uh, on these occasions. Um, Felicity, we're, we're going to begin with a little bit of your biography, I suppose, your spiritual biography, as well as just the, 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 the nuts and bolts of where you were when. But, um, but choral even song at Dunstable Parish Church is an important early part of the story. Tell us about that. Yes, it is. Thank you, uh, Christopher. And hello, everybody. It's lovely to uh, be joining with you today. Um, although I'd always believed in God because I'd been to a convent school till I was about eight and my grandfather uh, was, in fact, ordained, um, I never went to church. My parents ran a pub from when I was about eight, so Sundays were difficult. But when I was about 15, I suddenly felt this urge to go off to church and because we did other things on a Sunday morning and afternoon, I turned up at Evensong in a, a typical Anglican parish with a, a large male uh, men and boys choir and sat next, next to an elderly lady called Mrs Brown, who made me welcome. And um, over the next few years, actually was a really good friend and that welcome was terribly important to me. That's lovely. And you you then became a student in Oxford and um, and on a working part, I believe, at Lee Abbey, uh, there was a very significant kind of next moment in, in the journey for mm. you. Well, the next mo significant moment certainly happened at Lee Abbey. I went to the um, student working party uh, in the Easter vacation because it cost five pounds for a week in North Devon and I'd never been to North Devon and I thought I could cope with these terrible evangelicals from St Aldate's because my family tradition was a, a lot more high church than that uh, but actually while I was down there for that week I found myself asking whether I could join the community over the coming summer um, and it was while I was there 
that uh, I was introduced to the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the first night that I was there, I sat next to somebody who was a, a student from Exeter, but was on the community. And he said to me, do you know about the baptism in the Holy Spirit? And I, I lied. I said, yes, I was so lied. embarrassed. <laughs> um, but obviously that was on God's agenda because over the next two or three weeks, almost everybody I talked to on community and was speaking about the work of the Holy Spirit. And um, I wasn't sure where they were coming from. Uh, my theology at that point was that uh, I had received the Holy Spirit when I'd been confirmed, which was my only other brief encounter with the Anglican Church uh, prior to Evensong. Um, but over those two or three weeks, um, there was just a growing hunger within me. Uh, somebody had given me Michael Harper's book, Power for the Body of Christ. I'd read it. Uh, interesting, but I wasn't sure I agreed with it all. Uh, and in the end, I ended up talking to a lovely Welsh farmer called Jeff Price. Uh, and saying to him, please explain to me about this Holy Spirit business. It was only afterwards he admitted how terrified he was. <laughs> talking to me as a theologian, so he thought, <laughs> about the Holy Spirit. And he sat there with his A4 sheet of paper and Bible references, and we went through it for about, oh, I don't know, an hour and a half or two hours, I should think. At the end of which, he said, let's pray. Now, he was a Baptist, and I knew that when he said, let's pray, that meant he would pray and that I would have to pray. And I was terrified. I'd never prayed out loud except liturgical prayers in my life. And I heard myself say, Lord, I don't think I really understand all this, but if there's something more that you've got for me, I want it. I want to be open to you and your gifts. And after about a week of praying for the Holy Spirit, nothing had happened. I asked Jeff and somebody else on the community to lay hands on me. And for me, that was a totally transformative moment. Uh, I had to wait quite a while because Jeff was milking the cows and during that time God led me into a, a, the deepest repentance I think I've ever known in my life. But when they did lay hands on me two things happened and it was only afterwards I, I made the link with the biblical passages. First of all I knew that God was my father, Abba. And secondly, I knew that Jesus was Lord. Somewhere deep within me, and I have to say, I, I actually felt the Holy Spirit sort of filling me up physically at that point. They tried to get me to speak in tongues. I wasn't interested. I was just caught up with God. And all of a sudden we had to finish because I had to go on duty in the kitchen. <laughs> uh, a few uh, days later, actually, I found I was praying in tongues when I was interceding for another member of the community who was going back to Holland and about whom I was very concerned. But that encounter changed my life. Um, I came into a personal relationship with Jesus, which all my belief in God hadn't opened up for me. Uh, and I went back to for my second year at university. Um, a, a different person and over the next two years um, with a different vocation that I knew that pastoral ministry was what God was calling me to and a church-based ministry rather than uh, a, a role in uh, schools teaching education. I did end up doing some education in the end but um, that's I mean I, you know I just love hearing those stories I think it's um it's just so encouraging isn't it to, to to know that's the foundation for all that then followed it is and to know that god is still doing that today because i keep coming across people yeah for whom the spirit just falls on them or where there's that seeking after god for the spirit which is is met uh through prayer and the laying on of hands or or whatever yeah so I, I was i was talking to a vicar the other day in the most unlikely of circumstances and, and literally walking in the park filled with the Holy Spirit, um, 
quite you know quite just just the the sorts of experiences that um can simply only be god they're they're nothing to do with anything that we could possibly manufacture and that mm. seems to me such a mm. an encouraging mm. yardstick mm. Mm. Uh, and then you you went and trained uh, at st john's nottingham did a pastoral diploma and um ended up on placement at st margaret's aspley which um became more than just a placement it certainly did yes um uh, I asked for a placement in a charismatic church um, and got sent to St Margaret's where John Finney was then vicar. He'd been there a, a couple of years at that point. Um, and I remember the first Sunday thinking, I mm, don't know what's charismatic about this, but never mind. Um, except that a lady greeted me in the piece and she looked me in the eye and she said, you've been baptised in the spirit, haven't you? <laughs> And uh, this dear lady, Madge, became a very good friend and I, I lived with her family uh, for, for the next uh, six years, actually. Um, but I, at the end of my year, um, I ended up joining the staff at St Margaret's as parish worker, lay worker. Um, and it was, a, it was a thrilling, thrilling time because... Um, John had been baptised in the spirit um, while he was on retreat. Jo God just touched him. In, I think it was early 72. And, and by the, the time I joined the staff in 74, we got a whole group of people who were really seeking God and beginning to experience the power of the spirit. And over the next yeah, we used something called the Life in the Spirit Seminars, which was from the Roman Catholic Charismatic Movement, to share with church members uh, what God was doing. And we, we had lots and lots of people through. Um, but by the end of that first year, um, we got people coming to church who'd never darkened the doors of the church in their life, or certainly not as adults. And the problem with the Life and the Spirit seminars was because it was Roman Catholic, people understood about church. They understood about God. They knew something about Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit they needed to know about. But we needed something that would um, help introduce them to the Trinity and to the life of the church. And so John sent me away um, on the summer um, of, of, of 75 to uh, put something together uh, for us um, and out of what we called the new life course, which started with three tatty bits of A4. Eventually, uh, Saints Alive uh, came and, and was published um, seven years later. But that's a different story. <laughs> well, and we'll we'll perhaps hear more about that that later. But I mean, it, it's a, a the story of Saints Alive is a is a completely remarkable one. I mean, at that time, you know, let alone the the, the more mm. recent republishing of it, which obviously resource is thrilled to be um championing but um you know the stories of um of it just being printed and reprinted and reprinted because mm. just church after church was was wanting to get its hands on it mm. yeah it, it it reminds me so much of the story of the little boy who offered jesus his his loaves and fishes his picnic lunch uh because what we were doing was something for our particular context and God just took it and blessed it. We had no intention to publish it at all. We shared it with a few uh, churches in Southern Diocese who knew what we were doing. Um, and I suppose you could say we piloted it in that sense uh, with about half a dozen churches. But it was only when John became a diocesan missioner and asked Michael Harper, what is there? And Michael said, nothing get the wow. then incipient ARM to publish it, that uh, this began to happen. Yeah, yeah. But it grew out of our experience of the work of the Spirit at, at, at St Margaret's, which was, in, in terms of, of ARM and resource, very much a little local and ordinary church when we started off, though it became an extraordinary church that, that blessed many people but without ever sort of becoming the big names, St. Michael of Belfry or Chorley Wood or any of those things. We were just an ordinary parish church, but where God was moving in a powerful way, touching and transforming people's lives. Yeah. 
Well, um, and what a lovely hope that we can yet see many more ordinary, you know, local churches, parish churches and others um, coming alive in in that kind of way. Um, but but with that sort of root of, um, you know, just real faithfulness at, at heart, um, mm -hmm. it seems to be a kind of a signature of what you're you're saying. Yeah, I, I think the problem with the books that are written about renewal, those early ones and the more recent ones, is that people tend to pick out the remarkable stories and rarely tell you about the boring days and the difficult days and the challenging days and for the incumbent, the really costly days of being open to God and bringing renewal in the life of the church. Um, and uh, although we saw some remarkable things, we had a monthly healing service, which had begun just before John had come to the church and um, gone from quarterly, I think it was, to monthly. And we, we saw God do remarkable things there. And we hosted some celebration services, the sort of precursors to Pentecost praise that happened around the place. Um, there was just lots of ordinary getting alongside people supporting them pastorally, prayerfully, praying for them, seeing them come to faith, uh, being there for all the crises of, of life, which are just part of being human. And from, from there, you, you then taught at St John's Nottingham um, and then did a variety of diocesan roles and, and ended up perhaps a little bit surprisingly, going back into parish ministry, though, of course, then uh, as a priest, because women were able to be uh, ordained. Um, and so your your ministry in a kind of way went full circle mm. but with this um, strong association with ARM, Anglican Renewal Ministries, mm. and then subsequently with resource. Um, what are the kind of lessons about renewal that you think we need to learn for for today for for now mm. given all that's that's gone before and and there are there are highs and there are also lows aren't there um and we have to be able to reflect honestly on them both i suppose i i think so i think we need to celebrate the impact that renewal has had on the anglican church in all sorts of ways that that people joining the church now wouldn't realize that the um variety and flexibility we've got in worship, albeit within a liturgical framework, was something that was new. That understanding the church is the body of Christ, that every member is called and gifted for ministry um, was a new thing. Um, the focus on, on reaching out in mission and, and evangelism uh, was something that came very strongly through renewal. We, we need to hold on to those things. But I think there have been two um, particular issues. One is the tendency to jump on the latest bandwagon um, and not to discern and to test whether this thing really is of God. And even if it's of God, whether it's for us in our context. But the other thing, I think, has been a development of, of what I might call a charismatic culture in an evangelical context. The exciting things about the early days of renewal was the breadth, um, working with Roman Catholics, working with members of the URC, with, with Methodist Baptists, and the, the sense of unity that God brought there, and the richness of, uh, certainly for me, a sacramental understanding of worship and theology. And I think what's happened, because as renewal has become associated with particularly larger evangelical churches and movements like Spring Harvest and New Wine. And I'm not decrying those at all. People have been really blessed through them. What has happened is there's a danger of having a, a charismatic veneer because we sing the right songs and we say the right words, but actually missing out on that transformative encounter with God through the Holy Spirit, uh, whether you call it baptism in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, anointed with the Spirit, it doesn't matter. But that New Testament foundational outpouring of the Spirit that might come when we come to faith or might come later, but is all part of Christian initiation, as I see it. And I think there are many churches 
that look as if they're renewed, but actually individuals are not having that life transforming encounter with God. Yeah, no, well, well I think this is um, so important to reflect on. Um, I once ventured in a sermon uh, at the time that um, there was a political debate about were we going to have Brino Brexit in name only? Mm. Uh, mm. And I suggested that there was a danger in the church of Chino, charismatic in name only. Mm. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's mm. that um, mm. that danger. And what fascinates me about um, our brothers and sisters in the Catholic charismatic renewal, if you go on their website, um, uh, the, the bios of everyone involved will mm. tell you the day that they were filled with the spirit or baptised in the How spirit. I mean, yeah. it's just a very ingrained part of it and I wonder whether we've we've perhaps lost a little of our confidence in naming the significance of that in the Christian life. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Um, I, I think I was very um, blessed in when I did eventually get ordained uh, and, and moving back into parish ministry, um, becoming incumbent of a church where my predecessor um, had sought to bring renewal and had used Saints Alive as one of the core means of doing that. And, and there was that expectation there that people would actually encounter God, that they would make the commitment uh, to God in Jesus Christ, but also that they would receive the power of the Spirit um, and uh, that, that they would give testimony to that. And, and so encourage other people to do so. Um, but also that, that spontaneous working of God, when, when, when you were talking earlier, I remembered um, a lovely, lovely lady called Mary uh, who had come to her neighbor's confirmation. Jack had come to my induction and I didn't know that he hadn't been to church in 50 years or more, 60 years probably, uh, but he'd come to my induction and he'd started coming to church because somehow or other he found a peace in that very Anglican service. And over the next few months, he discovered that God answered prayer. And so he came on the very first Saints Alive course I ran in the Easter as I'd become incumbent in the previous Advent. And Mary came to his confirmation service and God just touched her in that service. And the Monday morning, she, she was on the phone first thing saying, you've got to come around and you've got to talk to me. You've got to tell me about this course that, um, uh, that Jack has been on and more importantly about the God that's behind it. And uh, it, it was just fantastic because she was just a very, I was going to say a very ordinary person. You know, she was, she wasn't somebody who'd had a career, she'd had a child, her husband was a motor mechanic and they were lovely and they were faithful and God touched them in remarkable ways. Yeah, and, it's, and I, those stories just have a, a power in, in a local church setting, don't they? Because people will will talk about that because it's it's yeah. just noteworthy, isn't it? Yes, that's right. And 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 I suppose our experience there was we we did in a not in a dramatic way, but in a consistent way, we saw people coming to faith very gently, very quietly, very cautiously. It took time. Um, but therefore, people in church expected that to happen and expected people to share about their faith journeys, which I think doesn't happen in so many places. Uh, today. Um, uh, I, I was talking with some people in our local church here and it was just obvious that many members of the congregation had not seen anybody come to church except those who'd moved into the area and were already Christians. Um, and now we're beginning to see people explore faith, which is really exciting. That's fantastic. Well, um, this is just a reminder that if there is something that's, um, you know, piqued your interest uh, in what Felicity has been saying, do pop it into the chat or if there's something, you know, you'd like to mention, um, you know, I can see people who are 
you know, clergy on the front line uh, who've joined the call, you know, if there are questions you've got for Felicity um, or indeed old friends of yours, uh, Felicity, I can <laughs> see um, David somewhere, uh, David Mumby, who I spoke yes. to uh, the other day. Um, perhaps he's got a story to share. Um, we'd love to bring in, um, we haven't designed this series always to have a bishop on the call, um, but it has kind of turned out that way. Uh, and so, Bishop John Finney, um, who you've already mentioned, is is with us, and uh, and of course has been your kind of partner in spiritual crime over many years, uh, and you are the co-authors of Saints Alive. But I mean, John, what it's this isn't quite this is your life. But what would you want to say about Felicity's ministry and working on Saints Alive together? If you can unmute yourself, John, and we'll we'll bring you in. Um, yeah, well, yes, working for us is, as you, as you probably, Christopher, have learned yourself, is, is something which is stimulating. It <laughs> makes you think, because there's very little you say that she doesn't challenge in the nicest possible way. <laughs> and I find her, I must say, a delightful colleague to work with for that reason. She says, I do the same, but then I don't think she's right in that. <laughs> it's, it's been a joy to work with her, it really has. And um, I can remember her coming to St. Margaret's Asprey as a, a rather shy mm. girl hiding behind some lovely auburn hair, and she used to peep out from being these. <laughs> she peeps no longer. But and, and I, I can say, sorry? No, go on. I think uh, so much of what she says, I, I echo so much. And I think one of the difficulties we've got now is that inevitably we're thinking about the shape of the church, planting mm. new churches. What are we doing now? We're getting co over COVID. And we're worry worrying a, a lot about that and sometimes getting, I think, over worried. And we are failing to remind people of their need for God yeah. and for finding God. And that's why we have to, of course, wave saints alive because this <laughs> is intense. I was going to do it as well, you know. <laughs> You've got a better wave than I have. Um, but basically, helping people to find God. And I think at the moment we need, as we come from COVID, go back to the basics. And Saints Alive starts two weeks on the Father, two weeks on the Son, two weeks on the Holy Spirit. Now what are you going to do about it? Mm. And it's as simple as that. And so, that or something like it, I'm not fussed too much about Saints Alive, though I think it's the best. But, <laughs> <laughs> but all the same, I think it, we must get back to personal faith. Mm. And because our churches are not made up of potatoes they're made of, up of people who have thoughts and feelings and emotion and faith or lack of it and we've got to get back to basics i think and i think this covid emerging from covid is a wonderful opportunity because we're now setting a framework for the immediate future hmm. i mean my local church it's not going to be the same as it was two years ago. We're going to have one service. It will be Zoomed. And above all, I think, we're very much more closer together. The danger is that we become exclusively so. So there are both pluses and minuses. Yeah. And I think we're now in a situation where churches, in the next few weeks probably, will be setting a pattern which they will probably copy for years to come the new normal is beginning to take shape. That's so interesting. And um, I mean, we had the experience of uh, running Saints Alive uh, online um, mm. via St Aldate's in Oxford, where I was previously, where of course you both were um, <laughs> as students. And indeed it was a great joy to welcome you both like this <laughs> to that final uh, session and hear some of your stories then. But um, but what really fascinated me, I mean, obviously that was during the horrors of um, of that, uh, you know, winter and spring lockdown a year ago. Um, so arguably people were, were ready to find something to do of an evening. Um, but um, the number of people who were pretty established in their Christian faith, but said, actually, something that just took me through those Trinitarian foundations 
and then invited me to uh, reaffirm my baptismal vows, if that was appropriate, and pray for a, a filling with the Holy Spirit, whether for the first time or mm. or a, a refreshing. The number of people who said, gosh, that really helped or someone I was completely amazed said, oh, gosh, yes, I, I understand the theology of the cross now. Um, oh. I thought well, I'd rather hoped you would have understood it, you know, <laughs> if I'm honest. But um, yeah. but I, I, you know, I think the work you've both done and now refreshed with Saints Alive is quite remarkable in the way that it locates this high appetite for the work of the Holy Spirit, but in a in a proper, rigorous mm. uh, Trinitarian framework. Mm. Oh, indeed, want... there's, um, we have Laura Collingridge, yeah. who's a curate um, now in the St Albans Diocese, but was on placement with uh, with St Aldate's at that time, saying that um, praying with people on Saints Alive I've lost the chat now. Was such a little moment of joy in the darkness of lockdown. Laura, if you want to unmute and tell us more, you're very welcome to. It'd be lovely to hear from you. I can't actually see you on my screen, but oh, there you are. I am here. Hello. Sorry. Ignore the towel drying in the background. Yes, um, I actually didn't join the whole Saints Alive course, but um, just joined for the session where we prayed for people to receive the Holy Spirit. I think it's the first time I prayed for people over Zoom mm. in that um sort of holy spirit way and it was just really powerful to see god at work um across across zoom across countries i think we had someone in austria that we were praying for and just seeing god meeting with them um having always been so used to praying with the laying on of hands and being taught that was such an important part of prayer ministry that's how we do it that's the formula um i think for me it was just a very powerful moment of uh, expanding my horizons of praying for people in the spirit and thinking yeah there's more to it and it was just amazing to see people encounter God in a fresh way or a new way um it was it was it was wonderful thank you yes and of course that was partly because of all of the the logistical challenges of how do you do the mm. equivalent of uh, praying around a circle in someone's living room uh, <laughs> you know with lots of people in different uh, zoom uh, contexts but we we managed it but more to the point god broke through any concerns we might have had about not being able to to lay hands uh, or whatever i mean what what are your hopes for for saints alive in the future felicity Oh, uh, that more and more people will find it a tool that helps them to uh, share faith with others. Um, uh, I think it's, it is very adaptable. Uh, it was designed to be adaptable. So although you used it on Zoom with a large group of people, um, we've just used it in, in my local parish uh, with um, one group of, of, of a leader and three men and a group of ladies, about eight ladies on a, an afternoon. Um, and uh, I think one of the strengths there is that uh, it seeks to begin where people are to um, value their experience and their spiritual journeys, whatever those might be, and to, um, to see God at work within the group. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether you're a, a UPA parish, a rural parish, a suburban parish, a parish full of professional folk or whatever. Um, God, it, it, it's only a framework. It's only a tool that God can use if, if leaders are prepared to, to, to listen, to pray and to enable people to share. Um, and John, I remember you um, speaking previously to me about using it even in prisons, I think, but certainly in very diverse social contexts. Mm. Mm. Yes, I, I used it in Nottingham Prison and uh, there were five lifers and all of them came to faith. And when I was consecrated in York Minster, I found one of them had actually got leave to come from prison with a warder, of course, in order to see me consecrated. I was thrilled to bits. He was sitting there somewhere at the back with a, ma a Macintosh over his arm, wasn't he, John? <laughs> That's right, he, he was well handcuffed, but they were trying to, as it were, pretend they weren't there at the back of York Minster. It was a joy to see it. 
Mm. It lifted my spirits, I can tell you, as I, I walked past in the procession, mm. really mm. did. Mm. Faith was something important, something was real. That man had been lifted from being a murderer to being a friend of Christ. Mm. I would say it's one of the, um, the really encouraging things here in Telford at the moment. So you, you may know that the Telford Minster new church project is, uh, is just opening up in the same building that Resource has its offices. Um, but there's also a Christian charity uh, in the building. Um, and indeed, it's the reason we're in Telford, because the, the remarkable woman who runs this Christian charity that works with ex-offenders um, believed that when she needed to move into a larger set of offices, she was keeping um, the current office is warm for, for resources, future move. Um, and, uh, and I think she was probably right. But, um, but the, the first people that we're seeing baptised coming to faith for the first time are through uh, the work of Yellow Ribbon, these, uh, these young men who are ex-offenders. And, um, and it's completely remarkable. And it, it does exactly what you're saying. It reminds you that the gospel is for absolutely everyone. And if you have risked ended up in a, in a situation where you know you're not hearing those stories of people coming to faith for the first time my goodness it's a tonic in the christian faith isn't it to be reminded of that particularly if if there's a you know the, the background and the change is so dramatic mm -hmm. yeah. um is there anyone else who wants to ask uh, anything of felicity um at this point um don't be shy uh, we are um, you know, wanting to make the most of Zoom uh, as a platform that enables that to, to happen. Um, otherwise, it just, you know, falls to me to carry on uh, asking <laughs> questions. Anyway, do please feel free to, to, to use the chat. Um, Felicio, oh, uh, Ron has raised his hand, it says. Uh, Ron, do you want to come in? I can't see you, but um, I'm... <laughs> I'm here, though. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, oh, okay. I, I, I'm really sorry to have missed the beginning of it, especially as I really wanted to hear Felicity, but I got delayed. But um, she and I were on a SOMA mission, I think, in Sudan. Yeah. And uh, years before that, going out with SOMA, <clears throat> we've seen the Holy Spirit move so powerfully. And then this, uh, this weekend, we had a Sudanese, South Sudanese, preaching at our local civic church which was quite a formal church. Mm -hmm. He had everyone spellbound and he absolutely had everyone uh, longing to renew their commitment to, to Christ. He actually preached so powerfully. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think, um, A, I'm delighted that um, there's that link with Soma being reformed. I think that's, that's brilliant. I, I think the other thing is, I, I think some of the future is going to line bringing people across here to re-evangelize us mm. yeah. yeah yeah i agree mm. and and uh, felicity just to say we had a lovely time in sudan but it was so short wasn't it it was it was very short particularly yeah. particularly yeah. with problems with flights yes yeah. <laughs> I, I still remember the going to that little church miles from anywhere and uh, yeah yeah um, amazing yes amazing yeah, yeah. We've got so much to learn from one another. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it, it's been good even while we haven't been able to travel, but uh, mm -hmm. actually technology has linked us with brothers and sisters across the world uh, in all sorts of ways. I mean, the, the but not so much with those in, the, in uh, places like uh, Sudan or Uganda, which I know well, um, where they don't have... I think Such easy the, access to the internet as we do. Yeah. I think the thing that makes the Sudanese, South Sudanese so powerful when they come over is for, firstly that they're slightly exotic and so people, mm. <laughs> I hate to say it, but people will listen. Uh, I remember my, my uh, Kenyan friend saying to me, they listen to anybody except the vicar. Well, I mean, they come across <laughs> and they're not the vicar, so they get listened to. That's the first thing. Yeah. People are curious. But, but the other thing is that they have to live their faith in such a, a, a basic situation where often there's no medical resources or anything else, mm -hmm. that they'll say to you, where else can we turn but to the Lord? And it, it literally is a dependence that they have to have on God. And therefore, 
full of faith and it just overflows. Thank you, Ron, for for sharing that. And uh, and you're quite right that we're thrilled that the partnership with Soma is mm. uh, is growing again uh, for for resource. Mm. Uh, absolutely. Um, anyone else who wants to to come in uh, at this point, um, Felicity? The thing I was going to ask you to say mm. a little bit more about was the challenge of um, uh, of of moving beyond what you you can call the culturally charismatic uh, mm. as it were because it seems to me that um you know if you are culturally charismatic you're probably pretty well served uh in the church mm. but perhaps a distinctive niche for resources to bring um these riches and uncover these riches in settings that might be more liturgical or just settings that haven't mm. previously encountered god in this way mm. I think this is a really, really important part of our calling. And in particular, to know that um, God can work through many, many, many different means, that we don't have to suddenly become culturally charismatic in order to experience the power of the spirit um, at work. And, and so um, one of the important links I think is that um, charismatic renewal has thrown up lots of vocations to ordain ministry. Uh, part of my background was being a DDO in, in Wakefield Diocese and I think virtually everybody who came forward to test their vocation had had a charismatic experience of some sort or other and a lot of them had come from the more charismatic evangelical churches well they now find themselves ministering in churches that have had no contact with that sort of tradition and it the challenge is how do we open up to the power of the spirit in those sorts of places um Four years before I retired, I was asked to take on a neighbouring parish of a very, very different tradition. Um, my, mine was a sacramental parish, but it looked more charismatic evangelical because we had a big worship band and a nice modern building. But this, this, this church, St Paul's, uh, had got a robed choir and wore the full gear, you know, chasubles and the lot. Um, and it was going into that context, building relationships there and finding out who were the people who were spiritually hungry and how we could work with them. Um, uh, I had a, a curate colleague at that point who lived in the village and that was immensely helpful. But we found that doing things like um, morning prayer once a week in the Lady Chapel, using liturgy, uh, we actually used the Faldi Brennan liturgy because we wanted to give space for Bible study. And that little group of seven or eight people meeting regularly on a Thursday morning suddenly discovered a love for the scriptures and a desire to pray and an openness to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that four years on, uh, the members of the robed choir liked nothing better than when they worshipped together with the worship band and we came over to do beer and hymns or they came over and, uh, and joined us and, and, and sang a four part anthem in the context of a united service. It was it was fantastic. Um, yeah. Well, then it shows what's what's possible, isn't isn't it? You know, I, I think it does. Um, and I think things like the the retreat movement and the number of people who now come on retreat uh, shows a real hunger for God and gives a real opportunity for the spirit to work. Um, as we've seen in the resource retreats, which we did last autumn, and I think were some of the most exciting things I've been involved in uh, for a very long time. Well, we've now uh, we've now got a rush of people raising their hands, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm going to call on uh, in the order that they raise them, uh, <laughs> Esther and then Vicky and then John. Um, perhaps the three of you can each um, say, I don't know if you've got a notepad, Felicity, but perhaps if the three of you can yeah. say what you'd like to say and then Felicity can respond. But let's hear from you each um, in turn, as it were. So Esther uh, and then Vicky and then John. Thank you. 
Um, you just mentioned retreats. I was going to say that you do lead a lot of retreats, particularly at Scargill, Felicity. How can we pray for you as you prepare? Thank you. Thank you. And um, Vicky. Well, I want to uh, to say how encouraging Felicity's last little bit was. Um, I've just um, been picking up one or two things about um, today that have hit me. One quote was, it's not what you say to people, but how you leave them mm. feeling when they leave you. And then a whole load of information about the nuns reaching the nuns n-o-n-e-s the people who are putting no people of no faith and that's growing in our culture and i can only think that those two together would be that we need people to be touched by transformed by the work of the holy spirit so that when people meet them mm. they feel different and Mm. Oh, that's my prayer for the church I'm in now, which is very poorly, I would say, um, and needs a life. And I'm hoping Christopher's going to help press the button to restore <laughs> it when he comes for a sanctuary day. Um, there's a remnant, but there's an awful lot of, I would say, discouraged and mm. maybe diffident people after COVID that, that mm. and they're quite elderly. And I, I just, think that Saints Alive will help us in the summer perhaps but thank you because that was encouraging. Thank you Vicky and uh, finally to John welcome to you John. Uh, just first of all say that the other time I met Felicity she was uh, a selector on my uh, <laughs> uh, 20 oh, wow. years, 22 years ago. Oh, um, it's, uh, anyway I'm, uh, I'm thinking that Saints Alive might be a good thing to run in my parish uh, but I'm also an area dean and I'm, I just wondered if you'd had any experience. I, I don't know if people would be up for it or not, but I, uh, uh, sort of running something like that in a, in a sort of deanery context mm -hmm. from a particular mm -hmm. parish. Thank you. Well, Felicity, do you want to speak to those and then um, we will move on to a time of, of prayer? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, thank you. Um, and, and, and thank you uh, for the encouragements that are there. Um, I have to say that Esther, who heads up our resource intercessors, it's a fantastic ministry. And as somebody who goes out on behalf of resource, uh, to know that the intercessors are praying for us and to be able to say to groups of people, um, I'm here, but there are actually a whole bunch of people who are praying for you today very specifically. Um, I think that's important. Um, what to pray when we're doing um, sanctuary days or quiet days or, or, or retreats. Um, I think it's simply that those of us who have the privilege of speaking will be open to God in our preparation and our delivery. And that as people gather, um, the Holy Spirit will turn up. <laughs> uh, the Holy Spirit is always there, but do you know what I mean? Sometimes you just know that God is there and God is doing something that is way beyond what our human words um, can create or, 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 or mean for people. Well, and um, this is what you and I had the privilege together of seeing at Scargill just before Christmas, didn't we? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, all sorts of people touched and transformed. Um, and just I, one of the other things about that, I remember the last session of that retreat, uh, which you were leading, and we got a sort of plan for what was going to happen during that day. And, uh, uh, and Adrian and Esther started worshipping as we were gathering, and God just started speaking. And it was about in the last 10 minutes of, of, of that morning session that you got a chance to say the various bits that you wanted to say, because God was just just there. Yeah. And uh, uh, and I think that's what I always pray for. It, it, it may be very quiet. It may be only afterwards that somebody comes to you and says, 
gosh, what you said there, that was so helpful, or in the silence, God said this, did this, whatever uh, in my life. But but the, I, I think one of the gifts I pray that the church rediscovers is the gift of intercession. Mm. And I think um, resource can model that through our through our ministry of intercession and those who who, who join uh, that band of folk. Yes, and um, I, I can't possibly not say that we are always open to new people joining the team of intercessors. So do just be in touch with the office if uh, if you feel a prompting in that respect. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And I think I mean what I take from from Vicky's um, comments as well as encouragement um, is that actually at the end of the day, it's people who lead people to faith. And therefore, our relationships with people are so important. And um, if we leave somebody feeling uh, supported, encouraged, helped by our conversation with them, then there's that much more opportunity for God to get in and the seeds that are sown to begin to to grow I think it's the sort of stuff that Stephen was saying to us last week about how we welcome people um, for the occasional offices or whatever uh, and uh, um, uh, and just sort of join with them where they are in their yeah. journeys yeah. Um, and uh, um, yes I uh, Saints Alive in a in a a wider context um i have not been involved in groups like that i don't know whether john has um but certainly it has been run in across groups of parishes or interdenominationally um and i think often this can be quite a good way to begin uh if you've got small churches or only a few people who are beginning to be spiritually hungry um, it, it needs to be done, obviously, collaboratively um, with, with, with the leadership of those churches. Uh, but I think it can work well and it can, can build really lasting relationships, which are going to be good foundations for mission in the local context. Uh, I think one of the things that we discovered over the years that was that people who are part of a, a Saints Alive group together have a bond of friendship and fellowship that goes on for a very long time. Um, and I can't think of anything more exciting than, than people from different churches growing those deeper bonds um, and, uh, and that being the platform from which to reach out to communities. So it's been done. It's not always easy, but it has been done. Thank you. Uh... Felicity, well, if um, if like me, you're thinking, well, I could listen to Felicity uh, all day. Um, I'm contractually obliged to remind you that you can do <laughs> exactly that. Well, not quite listen to her all day, but listen to God too. <laughs> <Not>. <laughs> but, um, Felicity is leading um, a Lent quiet day um, for resource at Fox Hill, uh, the Chester Diocesan Retreat House on Thursday, the 3rd of March. Uh, bookings are open and um, I think it's possible to stay either the night before or after um, mm. if that happens to be helpful um, for you. So you can access that via either the resource website or Fox Hill's uh, own website. Um, and also just to say before Felicity prays uh, and um, and indeed John Finney, perhaps you'd like to to pray as well after Felicity, if, um, if that's OK. Um, we've um, We've had some lovely feedback about these Wednesdays. Um, we're going to trial something else also at one o'clock on Wednesdays for five Wednesdays during Lent from the 9th of March to the 6th of April uh, inclusive. Um, 45 minutes of prayer for um, the renewal of the parish, but including an opportunity to hear from um, a church or churches where either we have recently or are about to work. So. Vicky, I'm looking at you, for example. And um, what we'd love to do is just hear from clergy or other uh, lay leaders in those churches about what is it that we can pray for? What are the encouragements already 
but you know what all so that we can all begin to kind of join in this ministry of intercession uh, if you like so the idea is that we would begin at one o'clock with the church of england prayer during the day uh short uh, service which um i think works really nicely and uh, then we would hear from a church leader or two uh, about what's going on on their patch and what we can pray for and then move into a time of open prayer and intercession uh, and prophecy even perhaps um in relation to the renewal of the church uh, not just for a particular upcoming weekend but that can be um a focus uh, as well so if you're interested um in being part of that we will obviously send around information on email but um felicity and then john would you like to to pray for us felicity we are so grateful i am so grateful uh, i think i can speak on behalf of everyone else as well Do thank you it's been a privilege to share um, let's let's pray together let's just take a, a moment of quiet because the Lord is with us in the power of his spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promise of your spirit poured out upon all people, which was fulfilled at Pentecost and continues today. We ask you to pour out your spirit afresh on each one of us, Lord. To renew our faith, to give us courage and vision and encouragement. And we pray for the renewal of your church in our land at this time. For all who are called to leadership within the church. For a fresh openness to seek you and to go where you lead. Because without your spirit, Lord, all that we do is empty words, but filled with your spirit. We know that you can reach and touch and transform lives and churches and communities to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen.